morning. Happy Sabbath to you. Indeed, I'm sure that you have been immensely blessed in that first lecture. What a God we serve, who makes himself known to those who desire to know him. Indeed, this camp promises to be a tremendous one in which God will be unveiling himself to those who will allow him to. This morning, my presentations for the entire camp, as a matter of fact, they're entitled The Gospel in the Sanctuary. Uh, this is really the introduction to the entire thing because we are going to plummet some depths. And, um, you know, we would think we know the sanctuary, but you're going to realize that the plan of redemption is unfolded in the sanctuary because it is where God lives and where Christ ministers on our behalf. Therefore, a look into the sanctuary will reveal a redemption that we haven't seen as yet. So I invite you to pay attention with us. These are going to be PowerPoint presentations, and I'm sure once the Spirit of God is permitted, you are going to be mightily blessed. So also there's this announcement. Um, those people who are parked down the driveway, we are suggesting to you at break time, you might be able to bring your car up onto the lawn because there's going to be traffic traversing in and out, and sometimes we get a little um, complaint for persons blocking also the um, neighbor's property. So bear, if, bear that in mind as, we, as you get a break at the next time. Okay then, well, to begin then, let us ask our Father to be our teacher. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Our Father, thou who sits in the high and holy place between the cherubim, you are the God of all gods, but yet you are our Father. Oh, what a privilege and assurance that you who rule the universe, we can come as children, laying our heads on your breasts, and you will be happy to enfold us in your bosom. This morning, we thank you, dear Lord, for the revelations that you have been given to your children. Grant, dear Lord, that we might allow our spirits to be indeed flooded by your spirit, that we can be transformed into the likeness of your son, Jesus. So attend to us now, open our understanding, that we might grasp the deep things of your word into which angels desire to look. Teach us now as you only can by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, the gospel in the sanctuary. I know that all of us know or would claim to know what is the gospel. So if we do know what is the gospel, when we look into the sanctuary, we must find that revealed, which is the gospel. And we know Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that the gospel is what? The power of God to save. And I'm going to tell you, in the sanctuary, you're going to see God's power mightily unfolding, even as he gave in symbols so that we appreciating it can follow and be amazed as well at that love that saves us from ourselves. Okay? Just introductory, just a little platform, and bring, up, bring us all together. Now, the Bible brings to view three words that indicate a place of worship for the most, or to the Most High God. It speaks of the tabernacle, the sanctuary, and temple. Those three words all conjure up, all connote, Worship. The first we shall look at is the tabernacle. Of course, uh, most of you will know Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. You know verse 8, probably, but verse 9 says, According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. That is, God had called Israel through Moses to make a sanctuary. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But the idea of the tabernacle is brought out in verse 9, as it's shown here. Now, this all 
construction of that tabernacle was really um, done during Israel's journey from Egypt and wrote to Israel or to Canaan. The second word you can look at is sanctuary, which really was built by God himself. The sanctuary was built by God himself. Note the first one was built by Moses. This second one and third one, they are built by God. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So Paul is summing up everything that he would have spoken prior to um, chapter 8 in the book of Hebrews. He said, the sum is, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of what? The sanctuary and the true tabernacle which God pitched and not mine. And you see here, both of the tabernacle and the sanctuary are brought together. And then the third one is the human body. You just hear amazingly how much the human body, how much an atom really looks like God's entire universe going around his throne. And we can also see that in actual fact. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us about this important temple that God himself constructed. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So we, in actual fact, are not our own. We have been given life by God, and therefore we are supposed to honor him. And in our bodies, really, you heard in the first lecture, is a reflection of really what God is all about. We are made in the image of God. But here, there are only two places, though, where God dwells. We mentioned three places that where God can be worshipped. But there are only two places that God really dwells. The earthly sanctuary was only a symbol. Therefore, the Shekinah glory was only a symbol of God's presence. It was not God there. Might be controversial for some people who don't understand what I've just said. So the two places that God dwells, are mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. I say here, Isaiah referred to these two places very succinctly when he says, read with me, at, um, Isaiah 57, 15 there, the first, of course, the text says, written. let's go together. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is a humble and contrite spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Ah, God says he dwells in a place called a high and holy place and also in the spirit of humanity, of his creatures, intelligent creation. So then when Christ said, God desires people to worship him in spirit, Spirit and in truth, that's what he's getting at. You see, brethren, God is not physical material. He's a spiritual and a spirit being, I dare say. And it means that because we have a spirit, he can be worshipped in our spirits. So that we don't come together in fellowship, but we really worship God in our spirit. Okay. Also, I want you to look at Acts chapter 7, verse 48, a very interesting um, portion that brings up something similar for us. Acts chapter 7, verse 48, and of course also Acts 17, verse 24, those two portions of scripture, we will compare to what was just said by Isaiah. Acts chapter 7, verse 48 says, and I read, How be it, and this is Paul now on Mars Hill with the Greeks that you heard earlier. He says, how be it, the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophets. So God does not dwell in this physical, concrete, and uh, wood structure. There's a more significant structure that God built that he dwells in. 
Also in Acts chapter 17, we go to that one as well, verse 24, verse 24, right? Acts chapter 17, verse 24, we shall read as well to see that God, again, that was Paul, sorry, that was um, Stephen, and now we hear Paul in verse 24 of Acts chapter 17. Look at what it says here. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. I want to disabuse your mind at this introductory lecture. Because many of us read a statement that NOA has written, which says that God walks up and down the aisles of the church and conclude that God walks about inside here as a space away with that. Understand is important. God dwells in intelligent creation. And therefore, the Spirit of God is the one who dwells in humanity and in intelligent creation. And God, therefore, then is not in the air, like Satan, the prince of the power of the air. God dwells in humanity. Bear that in mind. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Okay. And this is becoming very important as we go further. The earthly sanctuary, along with its furniture and all its sacrifices, the work of the priests, the services of the people, and the offerings of the people, were for the teaching of the gospel in symbols and types to Israel back then, as well as to us today. And I want to challenge those listening here on the internet. Can you go into the sanctuary and clearly illustrate or show the gospel as is brought out clearly by the Apostle Paul, for example? Can you pick up, look at the various symbols offerings and clearly show Christ in them. And like I said last week teasingly, there's an offering called the red heifer. Some of you have never heard of that in the Bible. Haven't heard of it. Do you know what is the importance of that particular offering? Well, we are going to plummet the depths and bring out some thoughts that shows the gospel will clearly preach to Israel, and therefore then they could have, and did have like Moses, an experience, and therefore he could be taken to heaven prior to Christ coming and ratifying the covenant at Calvary. Amazing, and all in the sanctuary, brethren, it teaches it. The sanctuary taught Jesus Christ, God's only remedy for sin. But alas, we have some comments to make here from the apostle to show us something about us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Go there with me because I want you to be able to learn and be text or to become familiar with these texts because we are now beginning to go a little deeper into what Paul talks about relative to the sanctuary. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Listen to this statement. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Unto them who? Israel. So the gospel was preached to Israel as it was preached to you today. But listen carefully. But the word preached did not profit them. Why did not profit them? It was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, when the gospel is preached today, and you don't get it, and you quibble over it, this is the reason, you know, it is not mixed with faith, and therefore you don't get it. So that what Paul is saying, we're going to get a very astounding statement, that why many of us cannot even understand the gospel today. And we will talk about the new birth, which Christ highlighted in John chapter 3, but it's carefully crafted inside the sanctuary. The next bullet says, the reason the gospel did not profit them then is the same reason it does not profit us today. Yes, it was not mixed by faith, but something deeper. Turn therefore then to 2 Corinthians 3, 13 to 16, as we're going to spend a little moment looking at why many of us don't profit even today by the gospel as Israel back then having the gospel and were not able to profit by it. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. I want you to make sure you follow so I'm not really doing many texts on the screen. From verse 13 says, And as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Okay. Verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Next verse 15. But even unto this day, what is the last part of that verse saying, brethren? When who? Moses is read, the veil is upon their Ah. Do you understand why you cannot understand the sanctuary as God designed? Or why people cannot understand the sanctuary as God designed? There's a veil, there's a blind, there's something that separates the understanding. And that is why in verse 18 of this same chapter, you have, We with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. But listen to two verses before that. Nevertheless, when it the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Paul is saying here, when you are converted, the veil is removed, and you can understand the entire Bible, including Moses. And therefore, the sanctuary does not become, oh gosh, that thing. Well, what is all that? What is significant? Why do I have to put that in the Bible? Is that important? And by the way, many people, you know, just something back, I send out a nice WhatsApp text or message to some persons, and some wrote about the sanctuary, that it, how critical it is to understand and know it, quoting from Desert um, Great Controversy, page 488. Somebody said, Ain't my dad important? Wants to know you love a God? Oh, it's very good. But you see, brethren, the sanctuary reveals just that, the love of God. But because of blindness of most Christians, you can't pick it up. Only when that veil is removed in Christ, that is the new birth, can you understand Moses and the Old Testament as is here shown by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So when you are, because you can't understand the Old Testament, it is no reason that it is, in your estimation, really something not worthwhile. The problem is you and me. We are the problem, not God. And verse 70 says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. You see, God is a God of freedom and love that you're hearing about. So once the Spirit of God is your spirit, you are free and liberated in Jesus Christ only as you remain in him, believers. So I'm saying to you this morning that many of us cannot read the Old Testament that is why the character of God is so difficult for people because their minds are holden and they are not free. That is, they're not liberated in Jesus Christ. Therefore, they desire a God that kills like their own idea of what the Old Testament is saying. But the Old Testament is not saying that. When the veil is removed, you see God and his son clasp their hands together in love for humanity. But alas, we are so dumb and blind to the things of God that we cast the aspersion on God and try to clear ourselves as human beings. So, we are going to see some things that you might say, well, Brother Austin, I don't believe that. And that's okay. I would just suggest to you, go and read on the inspiration of the Spirit and see if you can't come to clear conclusion. All right. Now, this is a diagrammatic expression of the earthly sanctuary. You might not be able to pick up on the blue there, but you know the sanctuary was divided into, the tabernacle was divided into two sections with the courtyard. Very symbolic, very, very important. You know, of course, when we talk about the sanctuary, we talk about approaching from outside the gate, but not God, you know. When God made that tabernacle in the wilderness, you know what was the first thing that was constructed? The Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony. And after that, everything else going outward 
was constructed. There's a reason for that. You see, brethren, God always starts on the inside and we're outward. If God has the heart, it's like we said last time, the leaven is put in the meal. It's not seen, but the meal rises or the door rises. Likewise, once God has the heart, the behavior on the outside become obvious. You see, but lots of us want to be reformed the other way. We want the body in terms of our eating to have good eating habits, good sleeping habits. Those are good things. Only if the spirit of God is in your spirit. You are trying to transform a human being from the outside in, and it does not work. How often do you castigate people? Oh, you're eating this or eating that. But you're not telling them that their spirit needs to be cleansed first, that what they eat can benefit them in the real sense of the matter. Many of us are just concerned with pretty looking bodies, strong sinews, being able to lift this and do this or do that. But the hearts where God lives are not taken care of. You can imagine that dichotomy. God wants to live in your heart and you don't care about it. He can't live in your body and your hand or your eye or whatever. And you care so much about that. You see how we really have everything upside down? Mixed. And that is why because our eyes are holding, we don't see truth as it is. So we're concerned about looking good. We spend all the time looking at our faces and our bodies. But how many of us spend real time looking, quote, unquote, at our spirits? When in actual fact, it's the spirit that God checks. He said that to um, Samuel. Man looks on the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. How many of us really consider the heart, the spirit where God dwells, to be in a condition it ought to be, but rather we like the outside expression because we can be commended on that by people. This is where the danger lies. But I'll go a little further because, like I said, it's just an introductory overview. Now, this diagram illustrates the sanctuary, and more than that, you will notice that it better be very clear, but it represents the body temple. Now, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, made a very profound statement that we might be sanctified how? Spirit, soul, and body. And Paul begins, like God begins, from the inside, the spirit, to the soul, to the body. Because once God has the spirit, the, the soul and the body will follow logically once God really is in control of your spirit. Therefore, that is the way that God designed the sanctuary. But God always meets man where man is in order to bring him where God wants him to be. So there goes the sanctuary, its spiritual aspect, the mental or the soul aspect. So that's the spirit, soul, and the physical, the body aspect. So we have a tabernacle divided into two sections. The holy and most holy place, as you would say. Therefore, that is where our spirit resides. The holy place, of course, is where our soul function occur. And we're going to go a little deeper into that. And, of course, the court, our physical behavior, is seen there in actual fact. And, by the way, you will notice five, well, we're calling dots from there, yellow. Those are the five pillars on which the curtain that separated the holy from the sorry the holy place from the courtyard was and that was crucial that was crucial because it represented your senses those five senses that we have seeing hearing smelling tasting and feeling see those senses and the way has this statement that we should have in fact guard well the avenues of our soul and you see the holy place that is the soul when we begin to disaggregate and pull it out. So that those five pillars are suggesting to us there must be guardianship of the soul from the impacts of the flesh, the fleshly mind, so that it does not influence our behavior, but rather the spirit of God in the word of God through the table of showbread, our eating of it will influence and cause our behavior on the outside to be what God designed and not the opposite. 
But we're going to pull those things out. I know it's um, a lot to grasp in one moment for people especially is new to you. But day after day, we're going to pull them out because it's a law and it shows the gospel and its clarity as far as um, I am aware and concerned. This next slide says, whenever the gospel is preached, if the same veil is untaken away, it will not profit those who hear, not being mixed with faith. Let's go to Ephesians 2 verse 8 and see what we are told there as well. So you see, um, our big problem is something called a veil, which we're going to explore a little more as well. And Paul, therefore, then tells us how this thing is to be done. Ephesians 2, 8. He says here, For by grace ye are saved through faith. It is a gift of, sorry, yes, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So except that faith is mixed with the gospel, that which God does in saving men, you will never understand anything that the sanctuary presents to you. And by the way, you won't understand what you think the gospel is the gospel. You won't understand it either. You'll be rejoiced and saying yes and happiness, but you wouldn't be having the experience that God designed, which is the issue. You see, it's okay to come and talk fancy and sound sweet, but if in your life there's no victory on a daily basis, the truth of the gospel has not taken hold of you. The gospel is what God designed it to be, his power. But if it's not incorporated in your experience, you don't know what the gospel is. You may have a theory, but it's not the gospel that God designs. That is not to say that you don't know, have to know it intellectually, you must, in order to be sanctified. That's why truth is a sanctifier. But if all you have is intellectual knowledge and it is not corresponding experience, as the sanctuary will show, you really don't have the gospel. Okay. Now, I say that only by faith can anything be understood, whether in a natural or spiritual context. You heard a lot this morning about God's power. And it needs faith to accept that, you know. Why do you think the atheists and those who are anti-God are so um, obviously anti-God and against God? They have not allowed the faith that God gave them to accept what he says. Therefore, we ourselves are in danger of hearing the Apostle Paul tremendous speakings and what we heard this morning but not allowing it to be mixed with faith and still we don't get it. That's an amazing thing. You can hear tremendous truth, but I said faith brings it, that is a hold on Christ's faith and bring it into your experience, you ain't got it, you know. You did God intellectually, but the reality is you don't really have it. All right, and this is all we're going to see in the sanctuary, of course. Hebrews 11, 3 talks about that faith. Okay, let's go a little further now. The sanctuary is a tenant paraphernalia, I call it, the priests, its services, and offerings for the people and of the people teach deep and eternal gospel themes of the redeeming work of our Savior. Are you aware that the sanctuary teaches the redeeming work of Jesus Christ? Are you aware in actual fact in the sanctuary you can find God opened up and revealed just as it is in the other parts of the New Testament? That's why Paul starts in Hebrews chapter 8, in actual fact. This is the sum of all that I've said to you. The sum is, we have a high priest. And when we begin to look at that high priest, what he went through, you can begin to realize in actual fact, hey, you know what? A peek into the sanctuary ex exposes and reveals that high priest to us. But alas, alas, how many of us go into the sanctuary where God's way is? How many of us do that? This, this gospel, of course, um, being the good news of the power of God to save, is seen in all the sacrifices, the offerings, the feasts, and the two sanctuary seasons. That may be a little pushback to some people. Yes, there are two sanctuary seasons. Two. All right. Are we going to explore those? Like it says, introductory. It is determined to stimulate your thoughts to come for more, really. 
Now, the morning and evening sacrifices were for the nation as a whole. So there were these two offerings every day, one in the morning, one in the evening. But individuals, whether priests, rulers, or ordinary people, had to bring his own personal offering for the gift, forgiveness of his own personal sins. You see, God has forgiven all men in Jesus Christ. But in order to assess that forgiveness, you must personally come and receive it. That's what the teaching of the sanctuary is. That's where it comes from. And if you check Leviticus chapter 4, let's go there. We've got a couple of moments. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 2, verse 27, verse 28, we're going to see that. Because in these first four chapters of Leviticus, we see four significant offerings, very important offerings, are brought out. So chapter 4, verse 2, says, first of all, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them. Then it says, verse 3, If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish, unto the Lord for a sin offering. The ordinary people will bring a lamb or, depend on their status, a particular offering. But the priests, the rulers, had to bring a delegated thing from God. It was a bigger offering. Not that their sin was bigger, but their influence was greater. And that teaches an eternal principle in the gospel era. That those who are leaders in the house of God, while you sin the sin, sin as a person, your influence is greater and affects the church of God more. Therefore, you are more culpable. You see, brethren, the gospel in the sanctuary teaches things that you do not realize. So I am a person who have influence in this congregation, yes. And if I do the same thing as another person who doesn't have a much influence, it is going to be more devastating to the congregation than that other person. Do you agree or not? It is the influence and not the same per se. And there's a lot to be said about that. And this is crucial. That is why when you see people of influence, especially in churches and religious organizations, do otherwise, you see a whole lot of people following down with that. You can imagine that. Or that people who have influence or responsibility in the house of God might understand that their actions can actually cause the loss of salvation to people. And this is taught in the sanctuary, you know. But we're going to go a little further. Look at verse 27, verse 28. Verses 27, 28. And if any of the common people sin through ignorance, why he doeth somewhat against any of the commands of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he have sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats. Now, do you see and meet the difference of the offerings already? The ruler or the priest brought a different type of, 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 of offering. But God designed clearly a smaller offering here. Not the sin is smaller. The impact or the influence is crucial. You know, brethren, we castigate Israel of old for not following after God. God, God did so much for them and yet they didn't follow. But one thing you have to admire with Israel, when God asked Israel through Moses to make a sanctuary, he had to beg them to start giving of their free gifts. You can imagine that. And in today's world, we have people enjoy the benefits of the gospel and not one cent will they offer in thanksgiving to God for what he gives to them. Big men who have businesses as well, they don't give or return to God that which God has empowered them by the health he's given them, by the skills he's given them. But look at Israel. They give till they hurt, till Moses said, look, don't bring no more. We got too much. You see how the work of God can really take a leap forward if there was this benevolence that God spoke about. But many of us are so scrunting, me are giving a tenth and that's about it because you feel that God says you got to give me a tenth but not realizing the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Brethren, the sanctuary teaches all these things. And these are things that we do not always hear expressed even though it's part of the gospel. And the objective of those gifts are not so much just merely to get for people to live on, you know, it is to get the selfishness out of our hearts. That's one of the things Ellen White said. There's so much selfishness that we just do so 
scrunchingly with God. You imagine that? God, the giver of all things, gave you life and health, ability, and everything, and you're giving stingily to the Lord and think that you got to give God. And this is, those are the teachings of the sanctuary. So there are many people that say and talk and be, and when it comes to the things of God, they're stingy. They don't even give anything freely to God. They're going to pay every single thing for the house of the Lord. Such persons, when, according to scripture, when God blows on their wealth, people say, but wait, I wonder what happened. Not knowing the selfishness in their heart is really keeping back the blessings that God has. Brethren, it's for us to examine our lives whether or not we're stingy with what God has given us. And there's a serious indictment on us all. You see, therefore, then it brings out the cheerful giving to God of returning to him his tithe and saying thanks to you, Father, for your, for your goodness and allowing me wisdom and skill. Here's this offering is thanksgiving. And not I got, but by God, to give that. Have you got a lot of, I would say, businessmen and those who get, get money? Lots of us treat God that kind of a way. But the sanctuary teaches that, not me. The two lambs symbolize the slaying of God's son, God's lamb once and for all for the sins of the world, for all humanity. You see those two lambs, one in the morning, one in the evening? They were done without your input or my input. God voluntarily, freely gave them for a purpose. And we're going to search out that purpose as well. And of course, John 1, 20, he said, Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Nobody compelled God to give but his love. Of course, love compels. You know what Paul said? The love of God constrains us. It compels us to do good. This is what sanctuary shows us. I'm going to move quickly. The morning and evening sacrifices teach God unconditional pardon in the gift of his son for all humanity without human input. The charisma that we talk about here, the legal justification, God fully and freely giving us of his all. Remember the statement of Ellen White. He gave, when he gave his son, he gave all of heaven to humanity. All. But when we give to God, we don't even begin to give. No wonder Christ had to say at the treasury, looking at the woman who was destitute and gave all that she had. And the big fellas walking in, big and boasting, looking real, um, you know, stooch, as you would say, putting in, let's say, thousands. But the thousands could not match for probably billions that they had. This woman put in just a farthing. And Christ said she put in all. And wherever the gospel is preached, that is always mentioned. But we who have a lot and talk a lot, don't give commensurate to the blessing God has given to us. Then, of course, the latter um, offerings teaches us the responsibility of the individual to give up his sins. So here in the science trade is the karazomai and the ephemi that you heard so much about. That has its basis in the sanctuary because you see God giving freely. And then the human response for the sin when it's pointed up with the spirit of God is to offer a sacrifice, a lamb, which suggests I'm giving up my sin to you to take care of their father. Or how the sanctuary teaches God goodness. Only if we will listen to the Spirit and search diligently. You see, God's redemptive plan in saving humanity is clearly spelled out in the sanctuary. And everybody should know this text in Psalm 77, 13. What does it say? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. No, it's the way. Listen, it is the way. The way of saving humanity. And all of it is revealed. All of it is shown in its depth. It's redemptive expressions. The love of God. How have you talk about it? The sanctuary revealed it because it is God's only way of saving, of redeeming. The sanctuary, in the sanctuary, is God's only way. And of course, and John 14, 6 tells us that Christ says what? I am the way. Meaning then, when you go to the sanctuary, you must find Jesus Christ. The way of God. But how many of us can find him inside there? It means that we can't find him otherwise either. This is an interesting diagram here. It should be a little more clearly. This an expression of an overview, like we said, you're going. The sanctuary, therefore, in its tabernacle can be said to be, of course, divided into three sections. 
the most holy place, representing in this case, say, the Father. Of course, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the truth as it were, justification through Christ. So the text underneath here, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is represented, therefore, then, up here in um, the diagram in the way human beings are saved. But I'm going to show you shortly, really, how God does it, how God really does it. You see, human beings, that red um, square there to your right represents the altar burnt offering, which really represents the cross of Calvary where Christ was consumed by our sins and for our sins. That is why those offerings that were consumed so much represent Christ. And of course, the liver, the liver, the cleansing, the washing by clean water of the Spirit. And then we'll get into the holy place, the truth. That is why Christ is the way. He leads us. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And of course, we are perfected, as it were, like the Father, according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 40. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So there the Israelites back then had a diagrammatic expression of how human beings have always been saved. Always. True Christ being God's way, leading to God. You find Christ, you find the Father, and you grow up into the fullness of Christ, you become perfect in him. But I have a couple of comments to read as I conclude. Like I said, it's an overview. We will pull out each of these as much as we can. These two comments come from Great Controversy, page 488. They're very telling. The arch deceiver, who is that? Who is that? All right, I hope you know it's the devil, our enemy. So you are not my enemy, you know. I'm not your enemy. Too often we turn the guns on each other and we leave the enemy to go clear. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view what? An atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. Ah, that is why the sanctuary is so crucial. Because it brings to view the atoning sacrifice and the all-powerful mediator or high priest. That's where it's seen in the sanctuary. He knows that with him, that is Satan knows that with him, everything depends on what? His diverting minds from Jesus and his truth. You think Satan foolish? Let me tell you, Satan certainly outsmart any of us. Uh -huh. But only in Jesus Christ he meets his match. But look at the, the, the other one, page 488, the next paragraph says, or the other section says, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. The sanctuary in heaven, believers, nothing else. But you don't want to look at the sanctuary, get the understanding and the experience that the sanctuary offers. But it's the center of Christ's work. She gets even more incisive. As I conclude, right? She says here, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross, oh, praise the Lord. You talk about the cross, and praise the Lord, it must be lifted out where it ought to be lifted. But let me tell you, you cannot denigrate the sanctuary because in doing so, you're denigrating the cross. Because the sanctuary is as essential as the cross in completing this work of redemption. So you still think that you can, a matter of fact, I wouldn't say that, let's read it. She says here, by his death, he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. So, Calvary was the beginning. The work in the sanctuary is the completing. So, you just want the beginning. It's like what the elder said this morning. 1888 was just the beginning. And it meant it had to go further and explode. Likewise with Christ's death on Calvary. It was, as it were, the beginning of the work that he came to do, but the completion is in the sanctuary above. Look in the sanctuary and see what Christ is doing. How many people know what Christ is doing right now in the sanctuary above? 
what is his work and his position. And those are the challenges that we're going to come to as well. She says, there we may gain clear insights into the mysteries of redemption. Ah, clearer insights into the mystery of redemption are found in the sanctuary. But we don't want the sanctuary. And I'll conclude here for now. This is a very interesting diagram that I'm going to use a bit more. I have to clear it up. But this, again, brings the sanctuary in picture form, showing us now, in actual fact, the atonement. Note the arrow to the top, that blue arrow which you're not seeing very well apparently. It says it's a pathway of Christ and providing the atonement. We are talking about judgment and atonement. That is the pathway that Christ uses from his Father to humanity. Down through that particular path coming humanity. From being one with God, only exclusively God, to becoming the God-man to bring to us the atonement. And in the same breath, judgment will occur. And therefore, you will notice then that, again, we have the divine nature of which he was. And the most holy place is referred to there. The second part, which is the grown-up portion of human beings, he took on humanity, and then, of course, outward, he had his baptism, and he faced Calvary. That was the method that he brought. But now the method that the pathway of the believer in appropriating now the atonement, Christ brought the atonement, we are to appropriate it now to ourselves by faith. The opposite direction. Having seen God's grace, his goodness, and his unsearchable love thrown out to humanity, we now, with repentance, receive the justification that Christ has wrought out. That full and free justification that his Father gave, which he in actual fact worked out also for us in our flesh. So we are justified by his life. Believing that, that is our faith, lay holds upon it, and from there on, sanctification of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, never ceases in actual fact, until, in actual fact, we become perfect in Jesus Christ. So I'm saying to you, just with those expressions, we're going to be looking at the sanctuary. We'll be drawing out the offerings, the various functions of the priests, etc., to show you that truly God's way is in the sanctuary. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your condescension we thank you dear lord that you have used many methods or many things to draw our attention to your amazing redemption plan we thank you dear lord in the sanctuary for the one who studies dear lord by your spirit great truths great and wonderful teachings are made known that you are the god who willingly gave your son for all humanity and simply ask us to believe him. And in believing him, dear Lord, you work a transformation onto obedience and perfection of our characters. Open our eyes, dear Lord, and give us understanding that in beholding you in your sanctuary, we might be made conform into your image. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.